Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be uh, able to bring you today's word from my home to your home. And today's message is called Immovable. As we celebrated VE Day last week, uh, we saw a lot of footage of one particular man, and that was Winston Churchill. This man, who was certainly a fearsome force in war and maybe uh, less effective in peace, was effective in war because he knew a thing or two about standing your ground. It was because this man knew how to stand his ground on things that we resisted the onslaught that came against us in the Second World War. This man was stubborn, he was difficult, (laughs) he was what you would call immovable. Churchill once said, be a peg hammered into the frozen ground, immovable. During these days where the world just shows how movable and shakeable it is, it's all the more important for us to keep centred, to keep solid, and to keep focused on Jesus. And as we look at this uh, topic this morning, I'd like to take the angle of looking at Paul's letter to the Colossian church. It's important to remember that when Paul wrote this letter, he was under house arrest in Rome. Now keep that in mind as we uh, read it, because it doesn't read like a letter of someone who's imprisoned. It's remarkably positive and upbeat. And it's a very serious letter. It was getting written for a very serious purpose. And as you read through it, you see the intention of the letter is to tackle a heresy that was becoming a huge issue in the Colossian church. And it's going to tackle some very big issues. And I don't want to get into the specifics of what they were today. We could spend a whole lot of time on those. But suffice to say, they were getting way off track from the gospel and from the truth. So Paul is tackling this stuff not by coming in on hard or negative, but actually by speaking about the nature of Jesus and talking about things that are positive and encouraging. See, sometimes the best way of defeating a lie is not to come out all guns blazing, but instead to speak truth and to speak Jesus. That is so much more effective. And so Paul starts this letter... (coughs) He's not starting it with a rebuke. He actually is starting it with an encouragement. An encouragement to people over the nature of our salvation and an encouragement to be strong and immovable. So I'd like to look at a bit of the first chapter of this letter to the Colossians. Not all of it, because (laughs) we'd be here all day, but some certain bits of it. See, life can throw a lot of things at us. Maybe for you that's the case. It certainly was for Paul, writing from his place of lockdown. Life can throw very sudden knocks at you. You know, everything can be going so well one moment, and then, boom, something knocks you right off course. A loved one got sick, a relationship broke down, somebody let you down badly, you fell for some teaching that was just plain wrong. You got tired, you sinned, you lost hope, 2020 happened. (laughs) Or maybe you're watching today and you've never actually moved beyond that initial decision. You put your hand up maybe to follow Jesus once, you prayed a prayer, but it never really went anywhere because of the things just got in the way. When we're looking at our lives and when we're looking at what it means to belong to Jesus, I find this passage in Colossians to be extremely helpful. And the encouragement I want to give us today is about being able to stand strong, to stand solid, to stand immovable as Christians. Or as this passage puts it, stable and steadfast, not shifting. I'm going to read from Colossians 1. and I'm going to read verses 9 to 14, then I'm going to jump to verses 21 and 23. And so from the day we have heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, 
being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And then from verse 21, And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled you in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Man, there is so much good stuff in there, and I just want to spend some time digging into it. We'll go through it a little bit bit by bit, because I think if we can apply some of this to our lives, it will do us the world of good. Colossians 1.9, he starts by saying, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. What's he praying? Asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So the first thing Paul is praying constantly for them, he's saying, there's something that I want you to have. Something that's good for every person to have. And it's this. Be filled with the knowledge of his will. In all spiritual wisdom and understanding. How does that happen in our lives? Well, the first thing is is we need to hear his will and to learn to understand his will. We need to hear and we need to learn. Paul's prayer every day is that people will grow in their faith, that they will know God's will. Now, how is it we can hear and know the will of God? How can we know it? And there's a number of ways to do that. And Dave Parry, over the past few weeks on a Thursday, has been sharing ways we can hear from God. But he's already highlighted this right at the start. There is a number one way. What is the number one way to hear from God? No, it's not through prophecy, (laughs) although thank God for the prophetic. It's not through a preacher, although thank God he speaks that way. It's not even through the still, small voice, although thank God again for speaking to us like that. No, first and foremost, beyond and above all of those, it's through the word of God. It's through the scriptures. It's number one by a square mile. If you want to be filled with the knowledge of his will, if you want all spiritual wisdom and understanding, then the Bible is the very best place to go. Now this comes with a slight problem. Well, not a problem, just more of a hitch. To learn the word, it can't happen by osmosis. You can't just fall asleep with the Bible on your face and have the words seep into you. No, the hitch is it will take some work. To know the word and to understand the word takes something from us. It means we need to dig into the word of God. It means we need to take the time to read it properly, not just to skim it so you can pull out the odd verse to fit certain situations. It means going beyond learning the Bible just parrot fashion. It means to be filled with the knowledge of his will. It means you've got to spend some time reading his will. Reading it and understanding it. Finding out not just what it says, but also what it means. Read it, explore it, study it. And I know study isn't always a popular word, but understanding does not come without putting groundwork in. That is the very best way to hear the will of God for your life. But the problem with that is because it's work, (laughs) we want to look for other ways, quicker ways, easier ways. 
oh, I need a prophetic word for my life. I need to get on YouTube and listen to someone who is saying what I want to hear. No, no. Those things are good. But when you pursue those things as an alternative to reading the word, let me tell you, you will not hear correctly. You will be open to deception. Don't pursue the prophetic instead of pursuing the word. Let the prophetic speak along with the word. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you as you read the word. Don't just get onto YouTube looking for something that already confirms what you think, because there's no growth in that. In fact, there's a real danger you can find yourself in a theological echo chamber where you can disappear down the heretical rabbit hole. To have the true knowledge of his will in all spiritual understanding. And don't let the word spiritual fool you to think it comes via a download outside of the Bible. Because the true knowledge of his word is the spirit speaking to you as you read and study your Bible. Now understand this. Especially now when we're in lockdown. And we have more time to start going down online rabbit holes. The best way to hear from God is scripture. The effectiveness of all of those other ways of hearing from God depend on doing that one. When we ignore learning from the word of God, we start to become unstable and our faith begins to wobble. The next part of the advice Paul gives is here, Colossians 1.10. So as to walk... In a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. See, knowledge and wisdom alone does not make one immovable. Knowing what the word says and what the word means does not by itself keep you fixed and firm. You see, unapplied knowledge is as much use as as a cruise liner in the desert. What we learn, what we receive from the Bible, it must be applied and lived to be any use to us at all. Walking in a manner that is worthy of the Lord. You see, some people, they have a lot of knowledge but no application. They can debate every theological point with you extremely well and still be found in sin. It's a terrible thing, but uh, some great preachers and ministers have been caught out like this, where their lifestyle is clearly not matching up. But it's not just about ministers, it's about all of us. We have been called to a high calling. We have been called out of sin. We have been called to live a holy life. Not just to, able to be, not just called to be able to argue what a holy life is. It's not about knowing the truth. It's about living the truth. What does a life that pleases him look like? Well, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. And it's not just the little stuff. See, sometimes we focus on on what's really the little stuff, like our language. But it's in all things. You see, we can't condemn bad language whilst at the same time engaging in gossip. Because gossip is worse. Wait, 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 wait one second. Did Pastor Luke just say that gossip is worse than swearing? Uh, yeah, swearing offends, gossip destroys lives. It's about how we love our neighbours. It's about how we serve the poor. We don't get to pick and choose which bits of the light we walk in. So here's some really helpful questions that you can ask yourself and ask yourself these questions often. Am I walking in a manner worthy of the Lord? Am I walking in a way that's fully pleasing to him? 
Am I bearing fruit? Am I increasing in my knowledge of him? Listen, they are hard questions to ask for sure, but they're very helpful ones to ask if you ask them honestly. Don't just ask them and give yourself an easy pass by ticking those boxes. But if the answer is no to those questions, then don't despair. Look to resolve it. It's actually healthy to do that. Because even when you look at the lack you may have now, remember how far you've come. <laughs> Which brings us to the next point and these next two parts of Scripture. I'm going to read Colossians 1, verses 12 to 13, and then 21 to 22. Giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. And then 21 to 22, And you who were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Remember where you came from. Remember how it was before you knew him. You have been delivered from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his Son. You've moved from darkness to light. Once you were alienated, now you are accepted. Once you were hostile, now you are in relationship. You have been reconciled with him. Remember where you've come from and remember what you now have. Remember what it was really like living a life without hope, without n the knowledge of that inheritance. See, sometimes life gets hard. And when it does, we sometimes forget what we have. We see the problems and we forget his benefits. But the Bible tells us, forget not his benefits. And the main benefit of your relationship with God, it's not your health, it's not your finances, it's not for freedom from things that held you back. It's that you get to be in a relationship with the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. That's the main benefit of our relationship is we get to have that relationship. We have hope because we have Jesus. Listen. There's no denying that what the world is going through right now is really hard. This is a hard and scary time for everyone. But imagine facing it without the hope of the gospel. How bleak and how hard that must be. The hope you have is so much greater than the hope you had. Remember where you came from. Remember what it was like in the dark. Because there is a danger of forgetting what our life was like when we didn't have Jesus. We start to view the past as not as bad as all of that. And, and when we do that, let me tell you, we're prone to wandering back where we came from. When we forget the severity of our mistakes, we can find ourselves repeating them. Israel were a prime example of this. They were taken out of Egypt and given freedom. Yet when they realized how hard the journey was going to be, even in the very first setbacks, they respond by wanting to go back to where they've come from. Exodus 16 verses 2 and 3, And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us in this wilderness to kill us and this whole assembly with hunger. How quickly they forgot, just at the slightest hint of trouble, how bad it really was in Egypt. Already they're looking at Egypt through rose-tinted glasses. 
Let me tell you, when you forget what your life was like before Jesus, when you start looking at it through rose-tinted glasses, at the slightest bit of trouble, you put yourself in a dangerous place. Because Egypt wasn't good. Going back was not the right choice. And it's the same for us. Going back is a dangerous choice. You might be watching this morning and actually you're still in Egypt. Because God still feels very far away from you. You're in a place now where you've never experienced the hope of heaven. Can I tell you today, there's only one way. You need a deliverer. Israel needed Moses to stand and say, let my people go. You need a deliverer, Jesus Christ, who with arms open cried out, It is accomplished. And when he said it, he meant it, because the life that he gave on the cross has allowed your life to be restored into relationship with God. Because he died, he took your place. You can be forgiven, you can be restored. You can be transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God. Come to Jesus and let Jesus transform your life. And the place that you're in now can become just a distant memory. Christians, remember where you were and remember what you now have. Remind yourself of it. You have been reconciled to God. And why have you been reconciled to God? So that he can, so Jesus can present you to God. Holy and blameless. And then we get to a very important part of this scripture. Because there's an if. You can be presented to God because you've been reconciled by his son, you can be reconciled by the death of Jesus to be able to stand holy and blameless. If, Colossians 1, 23. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. If you continue. If you continue to walk in the faith. If you continue to be stable. If you continue to be steadfast. If you do not shift from the hope of the gospel that Paul was a minister of. And that is my encouragement to you this morning. Keep strong, keep stable, keep going, because that if is important. Our faith is not based about around a one-time decision. It is based on our perseverance. It's so important. We do not shift from the hope of the gospel that is within us. See, Paul uses that word continue. That means you've got to keep on going with this. Christianity is not something you can pick up and then drop when it gets hard, but it's all going to work out okay because once upon a time you said a prayer. Heaven doesn't give out participation badges. No, you continue in the faith, stable, steadfast, and not shifting. You know, there's a lot of arguments about whether one's saved or always saved, but a lot of those arguments misunderstand what it means to be saved. Being saved isn't just about your response to the gospel. That's just the start. Being saved is about following Jesus, making Jesus Christ Lord. It says, when you confess with your mouth that Jesus was, believe in your heart that Jesus died and was resurrected, and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that means the boss. You've got to continue to serve. See, being a Christian. It is not just a decision you make, it's a life you live. We must be immovable on this, so we must live the life. You see, many don't, many wonder, 
Many shift from the faith, and it can happen for a number of reasons. Life can knock you off course, and instead of immovable, everything just moves in ways you didn't expect at the start. Your faith can get knocked off course when you convince yourself it's okay, but you wander from the gospel. Now you see, those things are nothing new. The Christian walk's always been like that since the start. That's why Paul wrote this. He knows it's true. He knows people need to be encouraged. Continue. Don't shift. You see, events like this COVID-19 crisis, it can knock some people. But it can also be a wake-up call to people who have previously wandered. And if you are watching and you've wandered, and you know you've wandered, let this time be the wake-up call you need. If you've shifted, if you're no longer living out in a manner worthy of the Lord, something needs to change. And and it's not about coming to church. I mean, don't misunderstand me. Christianity isn't about attendance. The church is a place that exists to help you live this life. Church attendance isn't about ticking a box, but helping you and getting resourced to live this life. But the thing is, when you wander from church, what often happens, in fact, what (laughs) tends to always happen, is you wander from the course you were on. You wander from the hope of the gospel. You wander from the truth. Getting connected again doesn't put you always right back on track, but I tell you what, it sure helps you get there. Continue. Continue. Sometimes because we've not been in the word properly, we're not learning what it means, we've allowed false doctrines to take us off track. There's a shifting from the gospel that was going on in the Colossian church, and the very reason Paul wrote this letter. See, if you don't know the word, it's far easier to fall for what someone incorrectly says to you. Keep strong. Keep stable. Keep the gospel front and center. How do we keep strong? How do we keep stable? How do we live this immovable life? Well, Paul has given us some great tips, and I'm going to just repeat those three of them. Number one, hear and learn. In other words, be filled with the knowledge of his will and spiritual understanding. You need to read the word of God. You need to learn what the word of God is saying, and you need to let the Holy Spirit speak to you as you read. Number two, apply and live. In other words, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Reading the Bible does not change you. Reading it and applying it does. Let the word guide your life. And Number three, remember where you've come from and remember what he's given you. Then you can walk stable. Then you can keep fixed and steadfast, not shifting from the gospel that was preached. Then you can keep the mission at the forefront. Then you can live the immovable life. That's my goal for myself. That's my prayer for you. That we will be Christians who are immovable from the truth. God bless you.